line of service, setting four, page 203 and following. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all of your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our appointed psalm for us is Psalm 85. We shall speak it responsibly, full verse by full verse. Psalm 85.
its strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even unto suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost comes from the prophet Amos, chapter 7. This is what the Lord Lord showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel. It is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak of gradually together. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. As is customary in the season of Pentecost, we move from one epistle to the next. This time we are opening up the epistle of Ephesians, St. Paul's letter to them, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peace. Amen. I believe in the 
and the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn today.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and an abiding comfort from the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, my sermon is titled, Removed by Centuries, and yet there is more in common with that, even today. My sermon is an attempt to make you see the similarities between our times and the times even when Amos the prophet prophesied. See, we have a very unique reading from the prophet Amos. In the years when he prophesied was between 760 and 750 years before Christ. He's raised up by the Lord to share with the people that God was going to overthrow the kingdom of Israel. And the kingdom which was already split into two, Israel with the ten tribes and Judah. And the northern kingdom was ruled by Jeroboam, whose name you just heard in the reading, and Judah was ruled by Uzziah. Now this is the same King Uzziah whose death is mentioned by Isaiah the mighty seer in the sixth chapter of his book. And that chapter reveals the great doxology, the everlasting song of the seraphim and the cherubim and all the company of heaven, that sound of the kadosh, 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 the holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabbath. So it is no surprise that Isaiah is fondly called the prophet of holiness. And the prophet Hosea, another variant of the same name Isaiah, is called the prophet of love. And see what a difficult task Hosea is given, that he must love an unlovable woman. Likewise, the prophet Amos is regarded as the prophet of justice. The prophet's name means to bear or to place a heavy load upon. Now the name describes his experience as a prophet. You see, Amos has a very bleak, a very unwelcome message that is given by God for him to share. A message that is running contrary to the narrative of the nation's spin doctors of Israel and Judah. The spin doctors are telling people to rejoice in their economic prosperity, in their political dominance. The prophet comes along and he speaks about a looming exile. He warns of an impending destruction. Well, when the message is contrary, maybe we should ponder. Maybe the nation should have said, well, let us just think deeply about what this prophet is saying. Alas, it did not happen. For how long can a nation go on shedding innocent blood? Even to Cain, at that first murder, God asks, What have you done, Cain? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from ground. Do you think that walking contrary to God's way will never have consequences? How long will it be that you will resist without falling into the hand of God's justice? See, Amos is considered the prophet of justice. In the Hebrew language, it's a word mishpat, like the word shalom, which never almost gets us the whole meaning of it. Even this word, the term justice, is actually viewed by us so narrowly. But thanks be to God that we have the weight of the biblical witness to help us when we make a mistake. And often that mistake comes when we sit on that unsteady purge of a modern secular outlook where we transform into arbiters demanding universal justice through poorly devised plans for social justice or we think that justice is such a universal idea all men will strive for it or maybe that we constantly tweak the laws that we have and somehow we will achieve Utopia, utopia in the Greek, which basically means no such place. So how do we get a clearer understanding of justice? What this prophet was talking about? So 
So in the first place, before we can start clarifying things, we have to agree that we today have a very limited meaning of that word justice. Next, we must all wholeheartedly agree that frankly, in the English language, there is no term that properly defines justice, just as the word shalom is never properly defined. So there is the difficulty, not an impossibility, but the difficulty of defining and translating this term justice which is used in the Bible. I will try my best and we see where we go from there. You see, the term justice in the Bible has a very wide meaning. It has implications. In the first place, it has uh, a synonymous usage with the term righteousness. So justice with righteousness. It is, in the second, a behavior that influences your dealings, both your ethical dealings, your religious dealings of your whole person as it is placed within the estates of the family, of the church and the state. And most importantly, it includes your standing before the Almighty God. See, justice, in the truest sense, is unbiased. It is devoid of any prejudice. Justice is unbending towards sin. It is a plumb line. It is not a pendulum. Justice means that all its requirements must be met in a God-pleasing manner. And this is possible only through the gift of grace. And finally, it is not a question of how these biblical ideas compare to the morals and the wars in the, of the age of, or the culture where you find yourself. No, that is never a good place to start understanding the meaning of the word justice. God's justice is solely in that it is pronounced. And it is by the response to this justice that the ultimate judgment is revealed. The ultimate judgment being either you will be saved or you will be condemned. And so the prophet Amos comes into this prosperous Israel, starts preaching against the sins, but before he gets to them, he preaches on the sins of the nations around them. Against Syria, he says, you are a cruel people. To Philistia, he says, you are engaging in slave trade. To Phoenicia, he says, you broke your truce. To Edom, he said, you refuse to make peace. To Abnon, he says, you are aggressors. To Moab, he says, you are seeking your own vengeance. And soon, he trains his guns on the chief object of his prophecy which are God's pronouncement against Israel's idolatry and Judah's pride. Now we can all use a broad stroke and say, well, Amos, prophet of the law, you see, he was just all doom and gloom. But we must understand that he is properly distinguishing the law and the gospel. He's not all about doom and gloom, but he also tells about the coming of the Messiah. Finally, in Amos 9, we see the wonderful promise that God, Yahweh, will restore the booth, the house of David. And so that book ends with a twist. It turns away from its themes of judgment to declare the restoration of Israel in the Messianic age. But we all still don't understand that completely. See, the messianic rule, as it comes even now, as it came in the time of Jesus, comes in very humble forms. It comes in a humble outpouring, finally in the martyrdom of St. John, the herald of the Messiah. More about that later. Now, there is some extra biblical tradition, and I don't always like to give a lot of credence to it because it's not in the Bible. But the rabbinic traditions say that Amos was actually killed after he was struck on the head by the king of Zion with the glowing iron. 
Another tradition says that he was struck on the temple by Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, of whom we heard in the Bible. The Bible does not corroborate it. So we must follow the view that the death of Amos is not clear. Although if it had been like this, the likeness of the death of Amos with a blow to the head would have been eerily similar to St. John's. The other prophet to, with whom we must contend with in today's writing. So to recap the first portion, we have understood the meaning of Amos. We have looked at the time Amos was sent as a prophet in a time of prosperity and ease. And also we look at what justice means. See, our whole idea of justice includes also this one aspect which you probably did not miss, but it is that Amos is prohibited from prophesying. Now for us common people, it can be when we disdain our conscience and God having heard the word of prophecy. That happens in our church quite often, doesn't it? We all know it, we have all done it. In essence, there are always people of God who pose that question to you. Are you a just people? Are you a merciful people? Are you walking in the ways of the Lord? See, we have examples after examples of people God sends to ask us those questions, to contend with them, to use that love line as our guide. We have examples of Jonah sent to the Ninevites, Hosea and Isaiah, and today of course Amos. And finally we come to the long line of the prophets which ends with St. John the Baptist. Many people say he is the last of the Old Testament prophets who spoke against the sin of Israel. All the while they were proclaiming the message of repentance and the message of the gospel. See, with St. John, as we go into that reading, he was the greatest born of woman. And our Lord kind of ascribes that glory to him. He is properly the herald of Christ. He is the one who is suffering for the sake of the gospel, just as all of you suffer for the sake of the gospel. Last Sunday, we talked about the cross being given to us and how at your life's end, through suffering, you are finally conformed Christ. See, as I said in the beginning, what differentiates our generation from that generation long ago? Nearly 3,100 years ago. Well, actually not a lot. Maybe all of you will draw parallels to our current day and age. The divided kingdom of Israel ruled by Jeroboam and Ju Judah by Josiah, they were living in prosperity. Some historians call it the golden age. Trade was thriving and the restored areas of the northern kingdom that Israel was at its greatest peak. And so the people were mistaken that this prosperity is a sign of God's favor. And the outward keeping and the doing of the sacrifices is enough as if we can curry favors from God. Along comes Amos. And Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, tells Jeroboam that the lad cannot bear these man's words. So he is put into exile. He is told to flee to the land and never again to prophesy at Bethel. It surprisingly means the house of God. So no more prophecy, no more words of law to be spoken from Bethel. similar prophet arises in the New Testament times. His own father prophesies at his birth, and you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, who will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of his salvation to a people lost in sin. And as soon as St. John starts his public ministry, 
dressed in camel hair, preaching repentance, preparing the Lord's way, he speaks against the king. And we know what is, that is going to lead to. Of course, the literary genius of St. Mark is to be appreciated. We can dive into the story of St. John's martyrdom. You see, St. Mark gives us the flavor and the depth of the characters at play in the death of John the Baptist. We can easily understand their motivations, the complexities, the character flaws in a very few sentences. Of course, we will not dwell deeply on these conniving characters. Much can be said about Herod, Herodias and the daughter, but we will leave it to God's judgment. The faithful rejoice because they are saved, Loss for those who are condemned. See, God's judgment, His justice, His eternal law never changes. And so Amos uses that word, Lamnai. That is the only time this word is used in the Old Testament. Never again. It is to convey the message about the steadiness of a plumb line, not the oscillatory movement of a pendulum. This plumb line is God's law and His justice. The same law that was upheld by the prophets, now upheld by St. John. And even now upheld by our church as long as it teaches and preaches the gospel purely. But you see, there are consequences for holding on to this problem. The famous is to be believed, the tradition is that it led to his martyrdom. St. John's story reminds us of the consequence of that confession that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the Living God. Since we've talked so much about justice, it is only that confession that saves you from the judgment of God. It is the only thing needed, the one good word that is believing in the Lord Jesus. And so it is with all of you. So dear brothers and sisters, as we come to these days, we all know what a dangerous confession we hold, we proclaim. It puts all other things in their proper place and always remains a dangerous confession. There is a warning from God, but I am neither a prophet nor a prophet's son. The words of Amos were telling. We live in an age where there is much prosperity, there is much comfort, the people have grown sleek with good wine and feasting. And so, before we end, I seek your attention on the similarity of that time of Amos, of St. John, and finally our own. See, this is where our nation, Canada, finds itself. The unborn are killed, children are turned to evil ways in schools. In the Canadian forces already, the chaplains of the one true faith are not encouraged to join. When will that time come when the nation will say, prophesy to us no more? The land cannot bear your words. We are a nation of no mercy. We are a nation of no justice. We are a nation long ago stopped walking in the ways of the Lord. And let the people here not think, oh, we are better than them. No, we participate in the sin of our brothers and sisters. And so, oh Lord, have mercy on us. And indeed, the Lord have mercy. Those who repent of their evil will find indeed that with the Lord there is forgiveness and mercy. So run quickly, eat in haste, savor at the foretaste of the meal, the marriage feast of the Lamb prepared for you before the very foundations of the world. So that with the strength of this heavenly manna, you may indeed become a just people, a people who show mercy, a people who walk in His holy ways. For it is said, you are indeed a holy people unto a holy God. So receive from the Lord's right hand the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Join with the angels and the archangels, the prophet Amos and Saint John. 
and all our dearly departed in the faith, even our sister Rubina, who has now joined the company of heaven. In Jesus' holy name.
up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, and we all praising you and say.
Son's body and blood, keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of His coming, we may together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lived and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.